Hi and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we've got new bikes and uh, we have a little bit of a talk about the future of cross-country bikes because things are most definitely changing. We've got a really cool rewind section this week, loads of retro goodness and some wicked stuff in a bike cave as well. Okay, so uh, well, let's jump into this week's show and I wanna talk about cross-country. So a few of you, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of you actually, ended up watching the XC Racing from Tokyo. How good was that? I mean, what a track. So that track, I reckon, was one of the most tech tracks we've had for, uh, well, as long as I can remember. Anyway, proper good rock features, loads of good off-camber natural routes and stuff. Even some proper, like, good little shoots and uh, berms into rocky sections. I mean, Pauline Fran Provost, she got caught out by one of those early on, which, um, I don't know, it might have cost her the race, but uh, I'm not sure it was her sort of course anyway. To be fair, Neff was in a class of her own. Uh, and of course, Tom, Tom Pidcock. Um, yeah, yes, brilliant. Super stoked for the guy being a Brit, but let's face it, he outclassed everyone on that race. He was absolutely phenomenal. He didn't have any weakness in the way that he rode, both technique, uh, the way he rode the race, and the way that he attacked and showed strength. Unbelievable ride. Uh, but some really cool stuff going on there. But what I want to talk about is how not only the courses are actually progressing, but the bikes are too. So uh, Pidcock was riding what appeared to be a BMC. I uh, can't confirm that because I had no graphics on there, but assuming this bike was a BMC. So that was actually one of the more forward thinking bikes with the integrated dropper post in there. A slightly longer frame built around shorter stems. I think the max stem length is like 70 mil on some of those. I think it might be size specific. Uh, but the point is the bikes are slightly longer, slightly slacker, designed to handle what really, well, the direction that cross-country racing is going in. Uh, Neff, of course, is on that new trek, somewhere blowing the grounds between a hardtail, uh, a soft tail, and a full suspension bike. Really quite cool with that sort of sliding shock on the top tube there. Um, again, a totally different approach, but again, cross-country bikes are most definitely changing. Now, of course, I refer to Mondraker quite a lot because of the fact that they've been progressing geometry for some time. And although they didn't get a podium as such, their F-Podium bike, they do a down country model. Um, we'll talk about that a bit in news. But um, their F Podium bike, 100 mil cross country bike, but again, it's designed around 50, 60, and 70 mil stems. It's slightly longer using that uh, slightly more aggressive geometry. Now, it's not about trying to make the bikes handle like trail bikes, it's just trying to make them handle a little bit better for cross country bikes. Now, one of the things is if you were to put like a 30 mil stem on it and rake out that head angle, yes, you're going to be able to hammer down the hills. Are you going to split a tire? You're going to crack a rim? Any number of problems are going to happen. So it's about fine tuning the ride of the bikes to suit what's going on. Uh, Ibis, of course, are back in the game now with their new cross country bike. We're going to be talking about that in news. Uh, the XC, lovely bike. Uh, they've moved their stem length down to 50 mil across the sizes from 70 and they've put 20 mil onto the top tube. And uh, now this is a World Cup level bike. It's not a trail bike, so don't confuse it. Uh, again, they're just trying to refine where bikes should be. There's no need for cross country bike to have like anywhere over a 70 mil stem on there on modern bikes. So I think things are changing for the better. Although Scott might have gone a little bit far with things. Now I want to know what you think about this. So that new scale, the one with the, uh, sorry, the spark, with the uh, new hidden um, spark scale, whatever, the bold. The one with the hidden shock on the frame there. A beautiful looking bit of design, but 120 mil travel. Have they gone too far? Is that going into trail bike territory? I mean, Nino, incredible result for the guy. It wasn't a result he wanted, uh, but let's face it, Nino's been in this game a long time, and look at who won. Look how young he is, look at where his background is. Nino can't carry on forever. Um, I take my hat off to the guy. I think Nino is he's the go-to me. He's just unbelievable with his class on the bike. I know there's people that have won more, but in my opinion, the way that he attacks and approaches racing and stuff, um, going hard off the start. I mean, let's face it, Pidcock and other people are beating Nino at his own game now. Um, so Nino is ultimately responsible for this next wave of riders and racers. But um, back to that 120 mil bike, is that too much for cross country? I mean, it seems to work for him. He rides it amazingly well. It looks so comfortable off that big rock drop at uh, Tokyo and on the rest of the course, but um, it, didn't, it didn't ultimately get on the podium though, did it? So uh, interesting stuff. What are your thoughts on where cross country bikes are going? Do you see more brands going with a slightly longer approach, not too radical? Um, do you see angles changing that much? Do you see more brands going with the drop post? You are starting to see more racers, uh, in particular women actually. Loads more than women tend to be using drop posts than the men. Uh, haven't figured that one out yet. And um, of course, are people going to be going up in travel? Because um, the downcountry thing 
isn't necessarily going away. Uh, and although it's a bit of a made up marketing term, it's definitely made people think differently about cross country bikes. Um, Either way, I'm super excited about cross country. I want more cross country stuff on this channel and I've actually been neglecting my bike, so uh, I'm gonna get out on it at the weekend. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments underneath. Bit of a random chat, I know, but uh, I just want to talk about cross country because I thought Tokyo was unreal. Seeing my favorite sport in the Olympics. How cool is that? Okay, so let's dive into news. And uh, first up is Mondraker have just released their 2022 range. Um, now, I'm not, not gonna talk about anything in particular because it just seems there's a lot of revisions in a range. I'm gonna throw a load of shots on screen because they've sent us some of the images. And of course, I'm just looking at one on my screen now. Uh, some of their bikes just look unreal. Um, so first up, interestingly, they've told us that the Mind telemetry system that they've developed is gonna be appearing on more bikes. At time, with the press kit I've got, I haven't got confirmation on which bike, so I will come back to on that. We'll talk a bit more about that because I've not tried it and I'm really keen to have a go on it just to see how it works. Because there's a whole bunch of really cool things for the users on the market. So there's shock whiz, there's tire whiz out there. Uh, it appears that SRAM might be developing something else, uh, but super cool to have these things built into bikes. So I just want to reference a few cool bikes in their range to check out. Now, the first one's actually a downhill bike, so not something I talk about that often anymore more um, just because I think a downhill is a little bit out of reach for a lot of people myself included uh, but the bikes I think are the coolest bikes of the lot by a milestone so let's talk about more downhill bikes on GMBN so the summon downhill bike so they released the aloe one fairly recently and that with that slender top tube into the seats there what a bike that just looks like a super bike doesn't it like a you know, as you'd imagine, like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari would be built. It looks like it's designed for racing and just what an unbelievable looking bike. And when they released it, they said, yeah, we've gone to this because we think it's the best way. And let's face it, we all knew there was gonna be a carbon one coming and uh, here it is. So this is the carbon one. We've seen it being raced already, uh, but it's available to buy. And I mean, look at the thing, it's absolutely beautiful. I've got a say though. I'd go for the aloe one. Um, sorry, Mondraker, I would definitely have the aloe one out of the two. Um, but I'm not your target audience for that bike, but um, which one would you have out of interest? Would you pick the aloe one or the carbon one? Money, no object, uh, and why? What would your reasons be? So really just curious about that. Let us know in the comments. Uh, so next one we'll talk about is the F Podium. So they've got their Podium bike, which is the uh, the hardtail. They've got, uh, I forget the other model, there's another cross-country bike on it, but more importantly, from my perspective, it's the full suspension one, so the F Podium. Now they do this in two models. So the standard F Podium is 100 mil travel front and rear. So that is your cross-country World Cup bike. Uh, this is it, there's a few shots of it on screen right now. But they also do the DC model, which stands for down country. Uh, essentially, it's just, um, it's in fancy dress, and it? it's the same frame, basically. It's got 115 mil travel on the back and a 120 fork. Amazing stuff, but don't confuse this as a trail bike. It's still a cross-country bike, uh, just designed to have a bit more fun for out-and-out -out riding. So for most cross-country riders, this style of bike is probably gonna be a better, ride, better bike for all-round use. And if you do any sort of endurance racing, let's just say like a, a 12-hour uh, marathon style ride, a bike like this is gonna be more comfortable um, with no additional weight bent. Uh, penalties even uh, going with it. So actually they do really have a place in the market, but where I think the problem is, is where people are gonna be riding them as lightweight trail bikes. They're gonna come unstuck. You're gonna break things or you're gonna have to put on heavier tires, heavier wheels and stuff, which kind of defeats the purpose of them. Either way though, I think this the category is really cool. I don't really, I'm not really a fan of the name, um, but it kind of does describe where they're trying to go with it, down country sort of thing, you know? Um, but super cool bike and the geometry on it. So uh, the re they've got small, medium, large, and extra large. Reach goes from 390 millimeters on the small up to 510 on the extra large. And it's based around a 50, 60, or 70 mil stem size specific on there. Uh, head angle is 67.3 on the standard model and 75.8 degrees. So you're looking about um, 75.8 degree seat angle it is. You're looking at about a degree slacker for the down country version of that. So moving on, the Super Foxy and the Foxy. So the Foxy was the bike that really made Mondrake famous when they released it with their tiny little 10 and 20 mil stems uh, that sat on top of the steering tube with their forward geometry concept. Unbelievable stuff, really, really good at the time. But they also had a Dune. So the Foxy was a trail bike and the Dune was their sort of 160 mil enduro bike. I noticed for 2022, there is no June in the range, and I know it's been missing for a little while. So I'm just gonna make a bit of speculation here. I think, and no one's told me this, I think, or at least I hope, that the June will make an appearance again, 
perhaps as one of those sort of mullet style, you know, 27 and a half on the rear, 29 on the front, hardcore bike park style thrasher bikes like the Bronson and like many other cool bikes at the moment. I kind of feel like it's missing from their range because they've got the Foxy, uh, which is their trail bike, and they've got the Super Foxy, which is an enduro race bike. Imagine the Foxy with long legs, essentially. So it's uh, 170 on the front, 160 on the rear, 29 inch wheels, all the usual stuff, reach from 380 to 510, based around a uh, 30 mil stem, even on that one. Yeah, I mean, there's not much else you need to know about. It's got a zero suspension platform on there. It's very neutral, very progressive. Uh, doesn't really get affected by your pedaling platform. Um, whatever you do on the bike, you can thrash the pants off of things. But the point is, I think the June is missing from the range. I think that could be kind of interesting. Uh, but enough waffling on about Mondraker because the, the range is really cool. It's just a, a revised range. So a few more shots for you on screen to enjoy right now. Next up in news, the new Ibis XE. Check this out. So this is their new cross-country race frame. Now, the first thing you need to know about this is it's not like the Ripley. The Ripley is a 120mm trail bike, not down country, it's a trail bike, so it is heavier. It's about a pound heavier than this. So I think the, the XE weighs uh, 2,000 grams. Uh, yeah, sub four and a half pounds, basically. So super, super lightweight. So make no mistake, this is an XE race bike. Uh, but the cool thing about this, well, there's, there's loads of cool things. The first thing is they've taken uh, the 20 mil off the stem and have bunged it on the front end of the bike. So the bikes are all slightly longer, uh, based around a 50 mil stem universally across the sizes. There are some size specific geometry traits in here. So they say um, seat angles vary from 73.8 to 75.9. I've literally just had this in the inbox. So small, medium and large are measured with the saddle at 750 mil high. Extra large is measured with a saddle at 800 mil high. So this is almost a bit like seat offset actually really seeing where the seat position is going to be depending on how tall the rider or the racer is on that bike so really cool thing uh, dw link is going to have a fair bit of anti-squat in a good way for climbing in those lower gears uh, fairly neutral the rest of the time so suspension is nice and active now a, a thing i especially like about these are they are designed in their factory in santa cruz in the USA and they're manufactured there as well. So I saw the sort of the forerunner for this where they started making some of their smaller size, uh, I forget the model of frame, but some of the smaller frames they were, were making over there. Now the system they're using with the mold itself, the mold heats, you don't put it in an oven. So you, you're using less energy to make them. That is a good thing. It takes less heat to make them takes less time to make them, less people to make them, and less parts of uh, carbon. So they've really refined the entire process to do this. And I think their long-term aim is to probably make most of their bikes, I would assume, in their factory. Now, I've already seen this. There are a few shots on screen of uh, when we visited them a few years back, and Scott Nichols was telling me about their aims for this. And the thing I've said many times about Ibis, they're not just in this to make better bikes themselves. They want everyone to be able to make better bikes. So they've shared this information with their factory that makes their frames in the Far East. So they want them to learn, acknowledge, and try and adapt the way they're making bikes. It's got to be better for the environment. It's better for everyone to get a better bike. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Now, the, the anniversary build, so the top spec one of these, in a size large, interestingly, most people quote for a size medium when they're doing weights, but size large weighs 22.6 pounds. That is including 125 mil dropper posts on there. That is seriously light. Oh, it's got those E-wings um, titanium cranks on there as well, which explains the price. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, what else? So, uh, yeah, I said a bit about the sizing. 67.2 uh, degree head angle on there. 413 to 519 mil reach across those sizes there. Uh, really cool. And there's three builds. So there's an XT build, the um, Shimano XT, which is 7,999, so just shy of eight grand US dollars, that is, by the way. I've got no other pricing at the time. Uh, SRAM X01 build, 9199. And the XX1 access, like the top specs sort of launch model, 12799. <whistles> uh, there's also a frame coming, 4,500. Um, but obviously this is a super high performance cross country race frame. Uh, I think it's really nice. I'd give that a super nice all day long. Okay, new suspension from Olins. We've all known about this for a while. So this is the fork in question, the RXF 38 Mark II. Uh, so taking all the technology from the downhill fork, putting it into a 38 mil stanchion single crown fork. I mean, look at the thing. You know, and it's Olin's as well. Let's face it, Olin's, uh, you put that on a suspension fork, you're going to look twice, aren't you? So uh, 160 to 180 mil travel, adjustable in 10 mil increments, 38 mil stanchions, 44 and 51 mil offsets available. It's got a TTX 18 damper on the inside and it's got their three air chamber system, uh, air spring system 
in the other leg. Uh, 2,320 grams for the fork, if a weight bothers you on a fork like that, which I can't imagine it would. Uh, it's got a floating axle system, kind of similar to the Fox 36 in the way of the clamps at the bottom, just to enable it to set up with no binding, you're not putting any sort of force on the, um, the bushings on the, on the lowers there. Uh, it's also approved for e-mountain bike use as well, which is cool. Um, I've got pricing in euros and US dollars, so it's 1,350 US dollars, 1,238 euros, excluding VAT. That will differ depending on where you are. Um, very cool stuff. Um, not ridden a set of Olin's forks ever, actually. Ridden a shock a few times, felt really nice. I'd like to try those. I think that looks like a really good fork um, with the development with riders and racers like Lurk Bruni behind them. It's going to be good, isn't it? I think that's going to be a really good fork. Let's dive into Rewind. So if you've got anything old school, uh, I don't mean like pictures of me, I mean uh, anything old like uh, cool old bikes or kit or anything from back in the day. Uh, we've got some stuff behind me, we've got a set of pace forks up here, even a, even a totem there for 2007. We'll take that as old school. Anything cool you got, there's a link right there, another one in the description underneath. Uh, let's see what you got. So this week, coming up on screen now, uh, we've got some great stuff. So we've got this Saracen here. I mean, look at this thing, this is great. So it's an old Saracen Tough Tracks by the look of it, but it's been turned into a bit of a single speed beta. So this is Joe in Bristol. He goes, I guess this would fit into top model rewind. Nah, rewind mate, all day long. Uh, it's a slightly battered Saracen Tough Tracks from eBay. Big mix of new and old parts. Getting fork was the hardest part. And I've got one designed for 700C wheel, but I'm running a 26 in there. Built up a rear wheel around a coaster brake hub. Oh, that's very cool. Liking that, gear ratio 40 by 18. So a coaster brake, in case you don't know, it's effectively like pedaling backwards to brake. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all you need to know. So you can run it brakeless, basically, and just use that as a brake. Uh, I wouldn't fancy going out Park Street in Bristol on a bike like that though, but I'm guessing that's part of the fun, isn't it? Seeing if you actually stop when a bus pulls out in front of you. Um, just about enough to get up the hills, but I don't spin out until about 20 miles an hour. Uh, easily the most fun bike I own and the one I ride the most. Simplicity is perfect. Do you know what? I think there's a there's probably a video in building something like this. Building a mountain bike for fun out of not much money. Because let's face it, when you get on a very simple bike or something different, even like a scooter or something random, we know it's not very good, but you kind of have the best fun on them, don't you? What do you think? Do you think we should do a video on, you know, building like a rat bike or a sort of a pub bike type thing? Uh, I'd happily do that because that bike you've built, Joe, looks like really good fun. Next up is from William. This is a 2013 GT Distortion. Just finished a bunch of upgrades. Uh, Fox 160mm upgrade uh, to a 2013 Fox Factory Float fork. What else we got going on? RockShox Debonair upgrade, tubeless conversion with new stands, Flow ZTRs, one up oval chainring, and more. Uh, who says 120 is cross country? The bike shreds with the best. Hey, it looks really cool. It's good to see it sort of bang up to date as well. I do kind of have a bit of a sweet spot for those uh, iDrive, independent drivetrain style bikes, because essentially uh, what GT did, in case anyone's not aware, is make a high pivot bike that pedals well without doing the idler wheel system. So they've kind of gone full circle because they're still doing high pivot bikes now uh, with their bike that's kind of secret, that's in plain sight when you can see Noga Karem racing one. Um, and Windmasters, of course, that's a high pivot trail bike. But it's just a totally different approach in the way that they do it. So what they used to do with these is the bottom bracket was mounted on its own little independent unit. And you had a pivot above it. And then the bottom bracket was held there by what they called a dog bone link, um, enabling sort of the rear end to move and the bottom bracket to kind of float. So it was independent, essentially, of, of what was going on. So that's that way that it wasn't affected uh, by the high pivot movement, which would normally give you loads of chain growth. So a really cool concept. And that one in the bright sort of orange, it looks like orange from here. I like it, I think it's cool. Good stuff, lovely pictures as well. Really cool to see, yeah, a bit of a hiker bike action there. And the last one is from Gary and Paul, look at this, Retro Gold, a DCD. So this was a chain guy, probably the first one to come to market, certainly in the UK that we knew about. There were loads of, sort of weird prototypes floating around like the Gobbler and all sorts of weird stuff. DCD though was cheap and it worked. Basically just wrapped a bit more chain around at the front there and it made a cool sort of buzz noise as you rode. Super simple, and the Dave in question was Dave Hemming, who was the first silver medalist we had, I, th I believe. He got a silver medal at the World Champs in 91? I don't know. Dave, if you're watching, or if anyone knows Dave, correct me on that one. Sorry if I got it wrong, but a uh, bit of a legend anyway. Uh, great guy Dave Hemming is, so Dave's chain device, that one is. Made by Mr. Crud, who made the Crud Catchers. Uh, and a few more things here, so um, what we've got. 
Pro setting tool for low profile cantilever brakes. Never saw those, but I remember the Shimano ones. Uh, if that is the Shimano one, what am I talking about? If I banged my head, I didn't recognize them because of colors. I've never seen them in colors before. The one we used to have in a shop was just like um, dark gray nylons or nylon plastic. I didn't realize. Wow, okay, you learn something every day. There we go, end of rewind. Now we might just have time to do a bit of bike cave action. Um, I've been waffling on because there's so much news to talk about today. Uh, so let's have a quick look. So in bike cave this week we have, whoa, wow, look at that. That is a wicked setup. So this one is from Matt in Phoenix, Arizona. I love the fact that we've got viewers literally everywhere. This is the coolest thing. So you've got a couple of Ibis bikes hanging up there. Really nice stuff. Load of number plates on the wall. Wicked workbench. Got some cool neons going on. Water tanks up top, compressor down there. Oh man, yeah, it looks well good. Got Victor here in uh, Sherman Oaks, California, a suburb in Los Angeles. This is my bike cave. I finally feel like it's ready for the world. My toolbox, toolbox even is equipped for my level of mechanical skills. Learned a lot on GMBN Tech and constantly adding new tools for more advanced services. Yeah, that's the way, just add stuff as you feel more confident doing stuff and perhaps you might buy a bike that's got a slightly different suspension configuration, you end up having to buy a few more tools. It's great. There's no need to sort of uh, have everything at once, you just kind of chip away, don't you? Loads of stuff in that cupboard there. Um, loving the fact you've got like an old school rug there. Very cool chairs actually, I like those chairs. They look familiar. Oh, and there's your bikes as well. Oh, look at this. Got a proper desk in there. Well, that's a workbench, but you've got it set up as a desk as well. Got your vice mounted on there. Got a little park stool on wheels and a slightly bigger stool as well. Husky tool cab, wheel true and jig. Okay, so you're taking it pretty seriously then. You kind of rate this. So if anyone's using a wheel jig, you know, you really actually are paying attention to what your bike is doing. Uh, it's a very cool thing to, to learn and do, but uh, definitely not something for someone to just go and buy one and try and true your wheels, because easy way to mess them up. Awesome stuff there. Man, you've got loads of bikes in there as well. I can't believe how many bikes you got. Well, there we go. That's the end of this week's show. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully there was some cool stuff you liked. What did you think about Ibis? Oh, I think that was the star of the show this week. Uh, let us know in the comments underneath. Leave us some feedback as always. And we'll see you next week. Ta-ra.